Elliot, I don't know if you just want to, for many of you have been here before, Elliot, you know, welcome back to Houston. Um, can everybody hear me all right? Yeah, okay, good. Um, thank you for having me. It's uh, great to be back in Houston uh, and a uh, pleasure, uh, yeah, to speak with my friend Ronan about the uh, the fifth act, America's end in Afghanistan. Yeah, and uh, before we start, um, you know, first of all, I want to you know, thank you, Marianne, for uh, you know, excellent introduction and recapping so many things to do that so smoothly. <laughs> I want to realize that it's actually sometimes one of the hardest things is actually read people's bios. Um, but uh, and, and also, I'd like to, to particularly thank all of the veterans. There might even be a few active duty members here or uh, SIV people. You, you may have heard of them as special immigrant visas, those visas that are particularly uh, assigned to a lot of the Iraqi and Afghans. Uh, uh, interpreters and, and others who wor worked with and a lot of times fought with uh, the U.S. military in Afghanistan and Iraq. So you, some of you I know here tonight. So thank you all for your service. You're all different levels, uh, especially you know, Elliot in particular. Um, and um, you know, I want to say you know, thank you for this, this book. This is, uh, Marianne's read already two of your books. I've read five, I think, of your seven now. Um, you're an excellent writer. <laughs> and I say it even when you're not around. Um, but I think this is also a, a powerful, important book in that you kind of present the highest level stuff from 30,000 feet um, of what was going on, decisions, why and how they're being made. You know, after your time in the Marine Corps, the CIA, um, you ended up as a White House fellow. You've gotten to know a lot of these people, you know, former, chair, you know, former Joint Chiefs of Staff, you know, former CENTCOM commanders. So you, and you worked for many years as a journalist in the region, so you know the stuff in terms of the highest level, in terms of policy, decisions, what you know, did or did not happen. But you also present it on a personal level for people like yourself and, and some of the people here in this audience who, who fought and, and sadly sometimes you know, died on, on the, on, on the you know, battlefields of, of Afghanistan. So I think it's an important book for the United States, um, you know, whether Republican or Democrat, to look at and reflect upon our longest war you know, how we prosecuted it, and sadly, the kind of catastrophic and chaotic end to it. Um, but I thought maybe I just would open, just I think it's something, it's, it's in, in maybe halfway through the book, it I think really encapsulates in some ways the two halves of the war in Afghanistan and to a degree in Iraq. Um, at, at this stage, you're kind of recounting your own experiences. You had once been a young, Infantry Marine officer uh, serving in Iraq and later Afghanistan, uh, later working in MARSOC Special Operations for the Marines. When we got out of the Marines, you worked for two more tours as a CIA paramilitary Special Operations officer. And you described the kind of odd juxtaposition of coming back in from a successful raid, um, obviously high tense, high stress. You, you mentioned uh, the own your own team that you led and some of the SEAL Team 6 guys who are with you. You guys come in, you're kind of jubilant, and at the same time, you see, I don't know if it was a platoon or, or what number of guys, just kind of regular kind of traditional Marines coming back into the same outpost that looked kind of haggard and dejected. And you felt almost a bit resentful towards you guys, almost a bit, not disdainful, but there was a definite disconnect. And, and you say the reason for that disconnect was that in the same country at the same time, we're fighting two very different wars. And can you help people maybe understand that even though the terminology is similar, there is such an enormous difference between our war for counterterrorism in Afghanistan and our war for counterinsurgency, which sounds similar maybe to some people who aren't you know, uninitiated, but it's really more in regards to nation building, yeah. trying to build upon democracy, and, and how those conflicting struggles have never really, you know, overlapped properly. Yeah. So I think the um, so I'm assuming no one has read the book. So um, <laughs> the the anecdote Bernard's referring to was um, I was in Afghanistan in uh, around 2010, um, and the the unit I was a part of uh, had a very clear counterterrorism mission, and uh, we had that night. Uh, successfully captured a pretty senior al uh, member of Al Qaeda who we've been tracking for a long time, and it was a complex mission. It had gone off without a, without a hitch. Uh, we worked all through the night, very deep up in an Afghan valley, managed to get out of the valley uh, without you know without too much trouble. And the last kind of stop on our mission was this one 
regular uh, combat outposts that uh, I used to group of infantrymen from the army ran. And so we kind of arrive in the outpost, you know, the sun is coming up, our hard night's work is done, and you know, and we finally, for the first time, feel like we can exhale. Like, we did it. We did it, guys. We did it. We got him. This is great. And we're kind of doing the paperwork to transfer this prisoner over to, um, the, to, to actually the military police who will take him onward to Bagram. Um, and, you know, we're laughing and everyone's sort of talking about the mission. Oh, did you see when Schmidt did X or Jonesy did Y? Uh, you know, and we're unwinding. And in that moment, the infantrymen who manned that outpost um, were sort of just... I was about, let me be like a squad of them were kind of processing past us. And as we were laughing, it was like one of these moments, you know, where you realize like maybe you're, you know, like you're laughing in church or you're laughing at a funeral. Like it immediately became obvious to me that our sort of, you know, laughter or exuberance, our sort of sense of victory was inappropriate in this context because these guys were so worn out. Um, and their victories were so, so few and far between um, that I felt sort of almost like this, this slight sense of resentment coming from them. And it wasn't something that I was foreign to because I had started my career, um, you know, as an infantryman in Iraq doing the exact same work that they were doing. But it did, you know, later as I kind of reflected on that, like just that, that, that moment, um, you know, I realized, well, why did I feel that way? It's like, well, you know, because we were fighting two very different wars. And so at that moment, the unit I was with was fighting a counterterrorism war in Afghanistan. We're going after members of Al Qaeda, but these infantrymen and you know so many people who served in Afghanistan, to include myself at certain points, and certainly in Iraq, were fighting this counterinsurgency war. And it's important to keep those straight in our minds as we think about Afghanistan and the end game in Afghanistan, because, and I would sort of pose this to everyone in the audience as a thought experiment. You know, we watched last summer a pretty spectacular end, and I would go as so far to say a categorical defeat of the United States in Afghanistan. Um, however, I would actually argue, and I'll, I would argue this today, that the overarching war on terrorism that was announced after 9 11 is actually a war that we have won. We won the war on terror. If I were to tell any of you on September 12th, 2001, that for the next 20 years, there would not be a meaningful terrorist attack in the United, United States, that Osama bin Laden would be dead, as would his successor, Ahmed Zawahiri, the leader of Al-Qaeda, you would probably say, wow, that's impressive. I don't, you know, we, that, wasn't, that wasn't a given after 9-11. I think after 9-11, we thought we were entering a world where terrorist attacks would be recurrent in the U.S. Um, and that wasn't the case. And because we were successful in prosecuting this war on terror. Now, so where do we situate the war in Afghanistan and, and frankly also the war in Iraq because it was founded under the same authority in the war on terror? And actually, if you look at the military terms for the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, Afghanistan was called Operation Enduring Freedom and Iraq was called Operation Iraqi Freedom. So these were operations subordinate to a broader war. So we lost the operation in Iraq I, would, I wouldn't go so far to say that we lost the war in Iraq, and we certainly didn't win it. But I wouldn't say we uncategorically lost it. I would say it's sort of a, a mixed outcome there, and so much as the Iraqis have gone now through five parliamentary elections. I mean, the government there, dysfunctional as it is at times, has held together. But um, it's important. It's, I think it's important as we move forward and try to tease apart the lessons from what happened in Afghanistan to keep clear in our mind kind of the different types of wars that were being fought there. And, you know, I, I suppose, you know, Ultimately, especially if you're in combat, you're, you're fighting for your buddies beside you. That That's your motivation. That's what's getting you through it. But um, in terms of kind of what you maybe were or were not told as, as a young Marine officer and then and the later you know, Marine, you know, more so like special operations, and then later in the CIA you know, paramilitary officer, um, was the narrative changing from what you heard from the government, whether it was a Republican or Democratic president? In terms of what the actual objective was, was were they saying this is a counterterrorism war, or was it this counterinsurgency, this idea of nation building, this idea of establishing democracy? Were you ever told or given a kind of a clear kind of explanation of, of what the end game should be? No, and I think if we look at 
20 years of war, it depended who you were going to listen to in the administration. There were different, I mean, administration, administration, depending, but there were always, there were factions with the administration. You know, like, for instance, in the Bush years, Donald Rumsfeld had a certain vision of how he wanted the war to go. But at times, his vision of how he wanted the war to go was at odds with certain senior Bush administration officials. You can see the same thing in the Obama administration. For instance, when President Obama, remember, he has to fire Stanley, Stanley McChrystal because Stanley McChrystal wants more troops in Afghanistan than Obama wants in Afghanistan. So there was always this tension. I think when we look back at Afghanistan, I mean, over 20 years, there was never a consensus over this is why this is exactly why we're fighting the war, and this is what victory means. And because we can never totally agree why we were fighting the war, and we couldn't at any time agree what the conditions for victory were, we wind up losing the war. And you know, obviously, policy-wise, at the highest level, there are a lot of things you know we could look at. We could say, you know, the overall U.S. commander was rotating about every year. Beneath that, you have different units that are rotating out every year. It's hard to have a degree of consistency. Um, but as you point out numerous times in the book, um, in a lot of ways, maybe what was what was the greatest kind of betrayal, even if it was subconsciously done, was for you know starting with Bush, um, the idea that we may or may not be involved for this long. Obama gets elected on a premise of we're going to get out of Afghanistan. I'm going to do this huge surge of 130, 140,000 troops, but it's 18 months and we look to pull out. You know, President Trump, same thing as a campaign promise. He negotiates with the Taliban directly. He cuts out the Afghan government um, and you know negotiates a, a, a complete withdrawal from the United States. And Biden, he could have said this is not working, but he decided to accept it and even accelerate that timeline. Um, can you talk about how these artificial timelines that we, we never had after World War II, we never had in, in Western Europe, we never had in South Korea, we never had in Japan, you know, we're, we said we're keeping forces there to, to basically hold back the communist threat in Europe, to hold back the Chinese and North Korean threat in, in East Asia. Um, no timeline is established. We've had tens of thousands of troops there for 70 or 80 years. Um, but what was the result of this idea of, of giving a timeline? And in essence, especially once Bush had decided to invade Iraq, that Afghanistan is no longer a priority. So um, I think it's worth considering that when you think of war, when you think of time in the context of war, you know, just like we talk about armies maneuvering on the battlefield and outflanking each other, like time is actually a space that militaries and nations maneuver within. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's how you use time in war uh, becomes critical for whether or not you win the war. Um, and so it gets a little bit to the, you know, to the title of the book, like why is it called the Fifth Act? One of the reasons it's called the Fifth Act is because sort of how can you get your mind around 20 years of war? It's very difficult to understand the 20 year war. It's so, it's so long. Um, and uh, when, I, when I started this book, it kind of stemmed out of a much shorter piece of writing I did. As Kabul was falling a year ago, a friend of mine, she has a very successful substack. She asked me to write. Uh, she called me up as I was trying to make sense of what I was seeing in the news and said, Hey, Elliot, I would really like it if you would give me 500 words on Afghanistan. I was like, what do you mean? She's like, well, people don't understand what's gone on the last 20 years. And could you, you know, in 500 words, explain it for, for my readers? <laughs> and so... And I was like, well, you know, I don't know if I can do that. And she said, well, you know, this whole thing is just such a tragedy. And people haven't, you know, people haven't been paying attention recently and they don't understand it. And that was that word tragedy that kind of led me into this structure for the book because tragedies typically are told in five acts. Uh, that's the classic tr structure, dr uh, dramatic structure of a tragedy. And so for me, the five acts, you know, were presidents Bush, Obama, Trump, Biden, and the fifth act becomes the Taliban. So that is a way to think about it in terms of a timeline. But as you progress through these five acts, what you see is, yes, 20 years is a very long time to wage a war. But if we put ourselves anywhere in that 20 year timeline, we Americans were constantly anywhere between 18 to 24 months from a major troop drawdown. You know, in the early days, it's we invade, you know, 2001 and 2002. And then look, we're leaving. We're going to invade Iraq. And now Afghanistan is a second tier issue. 
you know, then we come back, it's the end of the Bush administration, it's, it's you know, it's the war is improperly financed, you know, then Obama surges, and then in his surge, in the same speech where he announces a surge, he announces the troop withdrawal, which completely undermines it. I mean, so anywhere you go, I mean, there, there's, there's plenty of tragedy, but there's also this sort of, um, this rampant short-termism, short-term thinking that ironically leads to an incredibly long-term war. Whereas if we had had long-term thinking, I, I argue it would have led to a much shorter war. Um, and so again, time becomes this space that you see the armies maneuvering within. Um, and when, when I served in Afghanistan, there was this truism. And the truism was in Afghanistan, um, the Americans have the watches, but the Taliban have the time. Kind of meaning, you know, we've got all the gear, we've got all the helicopters, we've got everything else but the Taliban own us in terms of operational patience, understanding the timeline that we're fighting on. We, we are reacting to them in terms of the time. And because we were never able to convince, I would argue the Taliban, but also our allies there, that we had both the watches and the time, that's one of the reasons psychologically that we lose the war. Uh, you mentioned the Taliban uh, a few times in the book. Um, they're obviously, Significant differences, but also some pretty significant overlaps as well. Uh, you mentioned, you know, kind of your knowledge of the Vietnam War, obviously knowing people who fought in it. Uh, that in some ways one of the bigger mistakes we made was not understanding the motivation or the ideology of our of our adversary. You know, we were in Afghanistan, you say, it's basically for counterinsurgency, sorry, counterterrorism, or later counterinsurgency, uh, purpose and mission. Um, but we maybe didn't understand the same way maybe we didn't attribute for the North Vietnamese, you know, the NVA, Viet Cong, for you know, Ho Chi Minh even, that he was a nationalist who came to communism. That what was their motivational force was a national liberation. And you talk about how that maybe misunderstanding that that, despite their overlaps and correlations with Al Qaeda, that that was, should have been known better, understood better, as the guiding principle of the Taliban, it might have made, made kind of processing it more easier or better. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say our, one of the things that's fascinating about writing about war and thinking about war and seeing wars play out culture to culture is like they're, war is a deeply human enterprise. For whatever reason, we human animals do this. Generation to generation, we fight wars. And you can see, you know, history doesn't repeat, it's often been said history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And there are, there are a lot of rhymes of Vietnam. There are ways that these wars are very different than Vietnam uh, and distinct, but there are ways that they're the same. I think strategically, one of the ways that they are critically the same and a critical mistake that we made, um, that is a direct echo of a mistake we made in Vietnam, was, you know, if you look at one of the, if you look at the Vietnam War, a huge mistake that we made in Vietnam, was we believed that we were fighting in Vietnam, and the, the theory of the case for why America was fighting in Vietnam was dominant theory, was that we, at the height of the Cold War, as we were staring down the Soviets, we couldn't let Vietnam fall to the communists, because if Vietnam fell, then another country would fall next, and all of the world would go communist like a bunch of dominoes. So in Vietnam, the story we were telling ourselves as Americans was we were fighting in Vietnam to stop transnational communism. Now, if you look back at the history, and you tease about Vietnam, you actually realize like the Vietnamese, yes, they were communists. The North Vietnamese were communists. The Viet Cong were communists. But they weren't fighting a war for transnational communism. They, and their, they were fighting a war of national liberation. And we didn't understand that. Or it took us too, way too long to understand that. It's one of the reasons we lost the Vietnam War. When you look in Afghanistan, the early days of Afghanistan, I would say one of the critical mistakes we made in the United States was 9-11 happens. It's a traumatic event in this country. Um, we, we decide, um, based off, first of all, based off of early military successes, that our position vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban is, you harbored al-Qaeda in your country. You know, we all remember you're either with us or you're against us. They were against us. They didn't, they didn't turn over members of al-Qaeda. And very early on, sort of, Taliban and al-Qaeda become synonymous. Like, we just speak their names in the same sentence. They're all bad guys. And we have to deal with the bad guys in Afghanistan. Well, the reality is like the Taliban and Al-Qaeda are different and they have 
Neither of them are good guys, but they're different and they have different objectives. And it's key to understand their different objectives in the war. Um, and this kind of goes back to our early point, the difference between the counterterrorism war and the counterinsurgency in Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda are transnational terrorists. Um, they perpetrated the 9-11 attacks. The Taliban are not transnational terrorists. You know, the Taliban are, I would argue, you know, they're Afghan nationalists. They have a vision of what Afghanistan that should look like, which is sort of takes it back to the seventh century. I mean, I'm not a huge fan, but they are Afghan nationalists who want all foreigners out of Afghanistan. So they have no great love of foreigners. Um, they, you know, allow members of Al Qaeda who are also foreigners in. But the conflation of the two, when we looked at our strategy, because it all gets muddled together. Um, and I think when you look at the places where you know you could have had a different outcome in Afghanistan, key to that different outcome would have been recognizing that perhaps in the early days um, there were elements of the Taliban that could have been politically co-opted into Afghanistan while we hived off Al Qaeda. But when we lumped them all together, it, became, it meant that we had to deal with both of them, and we dealt with both of them imperfectly. And and just for anyone who might say what. Well, you know, leave a bit more explanation. Uh, you know, you have no rose-colored glasses for the Taliban. Um, you fought them for, for many years at, at different levels, um, as evidenced by, you know, our targeting and, and successful killing of, of the most current leader of Al-Qaeda, al-Zawahiri, in Kabul, in a nice neighborhood, in a nice house. Right. Uh, there obviously are tight relationships and maybe even tighter between Taliban and Al-Qaeda, but you feel we're maybe overestimating the threat or kind of over, I suppose. I, I'll be straight. I think that like in 2000, late 2002, late 2003, like if anyone says, how could Afghanistan have ended differently? I think there is an argument to be made that in late 2002, 2003, I mean, when we completely had the Taliban on their back foot, we have not invaded Iraq. Uh, all of our resources are squarely focused on Afghanistan. All of our attention is on Afghanistan. I could imagine a world where we could have reached out to certain elements of the Taliban that had fled to Pakistan and said, listen, there's a new Afghan government. You know, you all can participate as minority shareholders in this, and we're going to kind of co-opt you into the Afghan government. I think there could, there was potential there. What wound up happening was there was such, the door was so slammed for the Taliban. I mean, they were not allowed in. It was that they, we delivered them to the Pakistanis. And within three years after we went off, invaded Iraq, stopped paying attention to Afghanistan, Pakistani intelligence basically regrew the Taliban and reintroduced them into Afghanistan. So in 2002, 2003, I mean, it was not a good time to be a member of the Taliban. I think you could have politically um, potentially co-opted a number of them uh, in ways that would have made it very difficult for the Pakistanis to later turn them on. And you know, I, again, I mean, I think for anyone who says, you know, what's the outcome of, of Afghanistan? You know, I think every American who served there in any capacity, in the military, State Department, right, USAID, um, there is a, a great success, like you mentioned, that you told me on September 12th, 2001, there won't be another major attack in the United States for 20 years. I'd say, yeah, sure, whatever. Okay, that's not going to happen. Um, but, you know, I don't know if any of you came, when we, we also former Secretary of Defense, Esper, last week. You discuss it in kind of different terms in your book. He discusses what he calls a strategic distraction. That basically for 20 years, not entirely, but a large focus of our defense policy and our military was on counterterrorism. And as a result, when we're hardcore focusing on, on Afghanistan, hardcore focusing on Iraq, you know, other places, Yemen, Somalia, you know, Niger, Mali, wherever you like, um, the Chinese and the Russians are focusing on us. Mm -hmm. They're not focused on that. Can you talk about what we maybe kind of gave up in the huge, big picture strategy by maybe overemphasizing, you know, the threat of, of terrorism? Sure. So, I mean, the idea of, if, you know, the idea that we won the war on terror, I mean, I don't say that with any triumphalism in my voice. It's, yeah, we won, but it, you know, might have been a little bit of a pyrrhic victory in so much as, you know, one of the costs of winning the war on terror is that, you know, who has the largest navy in the world right now? It's not the United States, it's China. Um, that we, you know, not only we take our eye off the ball in Afghanistan and then by invading Iraq, but I would argue we took, took our eye off a much larger ball, which is, you know, our peer level competitors. Um, and the fact that we give 
you know, Russia, but I mean, to a large degree, China basically 20 years of runway um, to build up a military and really be able to compete against us. And that is an opportunity cost for the war on terror. And now we, you know, I mean, almost in the last, I feel like the last two years, you know, America has woken up to that fact and it's a, it's a new world. Um, and one of the things I, I appreciate about the book and, and all of your writings as journalists is um, fair game. You're as equally critical of, of, of Bush and Trump as you are of, of Obama and Biden. Um, they're tragically big mistakes and flaws made in all four of those administrations. Um, but you also, I think, correctly note the civilian military divide in the United States and you call out the American public that, you know, some people, you know, like you mentioned, look, um, when the quote unquote, you know, uh, Afghan papers were released and this is going to shock the American public about what they didn't know and what was being held back from them, you had said, no, what's really shocking is, is the lack of interest of the American public. And to me, maybe one of the most touching parts of the book, um, uh, and it was not the first time you were there for the, a funeral of a friend, you were, you were at a funeral of a friend um, uh, at Arlington Cemetery, which is, anyway, you've been in D.C., is close to Reagan National. And, I, and it's such a, a poignant thought, you're thinking, man, for just 20 minutes for, you know, the, the burial of our hero, could we just postpone flights coming in and out of Reagan National for 20 minutes for a family to have 20 minutes of quiet instead of having flights buzz over the cemetery? Um, can you talk about what that was like as someone who gave, you know, the best part of 10 years fighting and, and you know, intense hardcore combat and, and lots of other difficulties along the line to feel you're fighting for a country that's always was disconnected from you, that, that in some ways, after the first few years, people, some people didn't even know we were still fighting in Afghanistan. Well, I don't, I don't view any of that disconnect as being like due to any antipathy on the part of the American people. You know, I just think these wars have been unique in certain ways, right? So we talked about like, you know, how there are parts of the uh, war in Afghanistan rhyme with parts of the Vietnam War, and they do. But I'll say there's parts where they don't rhyme. Um, wars in American history were typically generationally defining events. Vietnam War, a generationally defining event. World War II, a generationally defining event. September 11th, the War on Terror did not define my generation. You meet someone who's my age, they would not say that the, the thing that defined them was, were these wars. And it was an important event, but I would say other things were more generationally defining. So, you know, and I've often said, like, if you look at those wars, right, you know, you have the Vietnam generation, the boomers, you've got the greatest generation, you know, you have the lost generation from World War I. Um, you know, I have never felt like I was part of a lost generation. I've actually always felt like I was sort of the, the lost part of a generation, that there's like this sort of small subset of my generation that went and fought in these wars and we've kind of found each other. And we're the sudden, like, you know, we're the ones over here doing this thing, which is the war on terror. Um, but what are, like, what are the costs of that? Like, what are the implications of that? And why did that happen? So if you look at every war that America has fought from the revolution to the present day, when you fight a war, you have to fight it with a construct that's going to sustain it. What I mean by sustain it, sustain it, generally speaking, in two terms, blood and treasure. Blood, who's going to fight it? Treasure, how are you going to pay for it? So if you look, the American Civil War, right? The construct that sustained the American Civil War, first ever income tax in the United States is to finance the U.S. Civil War, also the first draft. The uh, Second World War, right, national mobilization, war bond drives. Vietnam War, very unpopular draft, at least an anti-war movement that ends the war. So our war, you know, the war on terror, 9-11 happens, what's the construct for the global war on terror? It is, uh, the blood will come from our all-volunteer military, and the treasure will be, this will go into our national deficit, so there's never been a war tax. Um, and if you actually look, the last year the United States passed a balanced budget was in 2001, not a coincidence. And if you look at our national deficit today, about a third to a quarter of it comes from the war on terror. So what winds up happening is when you, when you sustain a war in that construct, well, it's an all-volunteer military, so unless you serve, you have someone in your family who's serving, it's not really affecting you, and there's no war tax. So the American people are anesthetized to the costs of war. Doesn't mean the American people are bad, it's just, you know, no one feels it, so it doesn't really impact our day-to-day -day lives. And I would argue, if we're sitting here scratching our heads saying, wow, we're hung over, and we're like, how did we fight a 20-year war? Like, that's why we fought a 20-year war, is because through four administrations, Democratic and Republican, our political leaders had like a pretty long leash on which to wage war, because the war wasn't a poignant, 
urgent political issue. Um, and so I would, I kind of would just argue and I question as we learn lessons from these wars and we think about wars we'll have to fight in the future, you know, let me say, if any, when, when my children come of age, if there is a war that we are going to fight, um, I want our politicians on like a very short leash right here where they can't go off and kind of wage it with impunity for a decade plus. Um, but the way you do that is, you know, is, is constructing the wars a little bit differently. And I, I suppose I might also note that, as far as I know, it's the first time in American history where we're involved in a major war. Uh, and not only do we, you know, not tax this or tax that or have sell so, so huge amounts of war bonds, we actually have massive tax cuts, yes. which, uh, which is kind of surprising. Um, just to turn to kind of the, the, you know, the final kind of really Act 4 and Act 5 uh, uh, of the book and where, we, where you know, things kind of conclude, um, you point out in you know, more than one time and more than one way that, um, yes, there were problems with the Afghan military, there were problems with the Afghan security forces, but this was not a military collapse. This was a political collapse that cascaded into a military collapse. Can you talk about um, what you mean by that and really how the political failing is what basically undercut everything else? Well, wars are won politically. I mean, you know, they're fought tactically and operationally, but you, you fight those tactical and operational battles so you can set conditions that lead to a political outcome. Wars always end with politics. Um, so, you know, when we see the collapse of the Afghan military in many respects, it's because there's been this, you know, there has been this massive vote of no confidence um, with the Afghan government and the two are connected. And we've seen this occur in other places like in Iraq, for instance, when the Islamic State swept through Iraq, it was, it was similar. If you were following the politics of Iraq at that moment, you understood that um, there were real Sunni Shia schisms going on right now, at that point. And so basically, you know, the Iraqi army walked away and said, we're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna fight against the Islamic State. So I think it's always important to keep um, the politics front of mind as you're trying to sort of just understand these wars and recognize, you know, the one thing I think that we as Americans get in trouble with is we can we conflate the tactical with the strategic and the political. So like when we look at like, you know, the fact that we just killed, you know, the leader of Al Qaeda in Afghanistan, like it's great. Um, we got him. But what, that's a tactical success. It's not a strategic success. If strategic success in Afghanistan was the United States being good at killing terrorists, like the war would have ended a long time ago. Like, we're good at killing terrorists. Like we've got that covered. The problem is we haven't been able to translate our success in killing members of Al Qaeda with a type of strategic or political vision for Afghanistan or these other parts of the world. So like when we we talk about like you know what was how could you know we have potentially seen different conditions in Afghanistan, and you know my sense as well, if we could have sat down and negotiated with a bunch of the Taliban leaders in 2002 and three and sort of brought them in to the Afghan government on conditions that were favorable enough of us, like that's not a battlefield. We're not, we're not talking, you know, that's not an answer that's a battlefield answer. That's an answer that would happen in a, in a negotiating room based off of conditions that had been set on the battlefield with what were very early American successes. The problem is we sort of squandered our early successes and then spent too long in Afghanistan trying to achieve um, potentially impossible or, dare I say, even quixotic aims in the country. And your, your book, again, it's, it's, it's fascinating because it, it oscillates between chapters on your time uh, as a military officer and CIA officer on the ground in Afghanistan, uh, and then alternating chapters between what was happening in those you know, horrific few weeks last summer with the complete collapse of the Afghan government, the complete collapse of Kabul. And can you talk about what it was like, you you and, and some of your, your, your buddies and your comrades put massive amounts of effort into getting out as many Afghans as you could. Um, not to mention the fact that it's hard to imagine how you know the Biden administration did not have a thorough, comprehensive plan to get people out. And I think people will be amazed when you read this book um, some of you in the military, the former chairman, Joint Chief of Staff Mullen, is texting and calling you to, to try and, hey, can you help get somebody out? The former, uh, you know, CENTCOM commander, um, uh, was it John Allen, I guess, you're in contact with him. How, how can we get people out? These are the highest level people in the American military administration and defense department. They don't know how to get people out. 
it fell to people like yourselves and, and the people on the ground. Can you talk about that process and, and how you, you got out at least the few hundred you're able to get out? Sure. Well, I mean, the Title of the Fifth Act also alludes to the fact that there are five cases of evacuations that I write about that I was, you know, among many others involved with um, this summer. And um, as you said, you know, it was really, a, it became just a pickup game, like a, a crowdsourced evacuation. And it, you know, and I was happy and honored to participate, but this wasn't something I necessarily wanted to be participating in. Like if there had been a, you know, State Department phone number or email address that in good conscience I could hand to someone and say like, call this number, they're going to help you. Um, I would have done it and happily, you know, remained on my two weeks of summer vacation with my, with my family instead of kind of being sucked into a war that at least psychologically I felt like I had, you know, I'd left 10 years ago. I wasn't, I wasn't still fighting in Afghanistan. Um, you know, I jokingly have said that if this book ever becomes a movie, and I hope Chevy Chase will play, it'll be like, you know, National Lampoon's European Vacation um, in Afghanistan, because that was sort of the, the feeling of it. And, and it, was, it's important, it was important to me in this book to show that juxtaposition with, you know, my family, and we're walking through museums, and my son's like, Dad, why are you on the phone so much? Like, well, son, we were trying to get this helicopter into Kandahar Air, you know, out of Kandahar Airfield. Like, wow, you know, like, because I, because I, anecdotally, I know that was the experience of so many veterans. And, and it, it, it makes you sort of, at least I'll speak for myself, but I think others had experience, it was psychologically dislocating. Um, like a lot of people did a lot of work to come home from these wars and say, you know what, it's over for me. I'm okay with how it ended. I'm, I'm moving on with my life. I have moved on with my life. Um, the war is something that exists in the past for me now. And then in a single month long period, it gets throttled immediately into many, many people's present. And what, you know, out of necessity, because there was no government response there, um, that was meaningful. Although, you know, you had people at the airport, you know, Marine soldiers, you know, behaving heroically uh, in very tough conditions. But now this thing is throttled right into the presence. And sort of what is, you know, what is the cost of having it kind of come back into the presence so intensely? And I hope that the reader picks up the book, they will kind of see that the book toggles in time that way. And, you know, you kind of mentioned it. Um, yeah, you know, I think a lot of times I think people, <clears throat> you ask, we talk about <clears throat> being the shadow of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. You know, <clears throat> what should we have learned from Vietnam? What What are the takeaways from Vietnam? But in a lot of ways, I think kind of your book and, and others say, in some ways, really in the shadow of World War II. We're in the shadow of one of the clearest, most obvious cases of an extreme bad and extreme good, an absolute full commitment of the entire nation to war, and definitive uh, idea of what means complete victory. It is complete uh, obliteration and surrender of the Nazis, a complete obliteration of, of Imperial Japan, Japanese military forces. Um, but obviously, we don't have that in the wars to come from there. We, we don't, obviously, not in the Korean War, not the Vietnam War, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Um, I think you make a, an interesting point, you kind of touched upon it, that in some ways, this is, this is so, some of your friends are still involved uh, militarily or intelligence-wise. Uh, Twenty years at this stage, you, know, you gave ten plus years. Um, the people who served in, in World War II, those who would have served the absolute longest, would have served three and a half years. You know, this is this has been the large part of your entire adult life. How how was it that you, I suppose, got to where you felt like you mentioned this is reopening a wound? that reopened wound for so many people you knew, uh, that you yourself had to make a decision to end the war or your vision of it? Um, well, I mean, for me, it was, a, it was just a personal decision. I came, to, I came to the realization after eight years of war that this wasn't the, it wasn't the only thing I wanted to do with my life. And, uh, and I was at a moment where I was still kind of young enough to go do something else. And, um, but then I had to tell people, you know, who, who I had, who I admired, who I wanted to be, you know, had modeled my career after, who were going to stay in the war, uh, who were staying in the wars and making careers as military officers or as intelligence officers, that, you know, I'm done, I'm going to go do this other thing. <laughs> and that so it was a very, you know, personal decision that puts some of those relationships, you know, under stress because there's that sense of, well, you know, you're, you're leaving us. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and that's, that's complicated. Um, but it gets to these ideas of, you know, the stories that we tell ourselves about war. Like they actually, 
they really matter. And I don't think we tell ourselves these stories oftentimes in a deliberate way. Um, you know, we talk about, yes, yeah, the shadow of the Vietnam War and the Korean War. I and mean, there's a lot of wars to think about. Um, at one point in the book, I write a little bit about uh, war memorials, which is something I've thought about. Um, and uh, uh, I, uh, maybe some of you know this, but a couple of years ago, uh, Congress passed the Global War on Terrorism War Memorial Act which is an interesting piece of legislation because um, the two co-sponsors, uh, Representative Moulton and Gallagher, Democrat and Republican, one of the challenges that they had was in law, you cannot pass, you cannot pass um, legislation creating a war memorial to a war that's still going on. Like if the war has to be over, then you can build a memorial to it. It seems to make sense that's in law, but they had to get an exemption for that fact. And so, um, and um, I, I know, uh, Seth, we were contemporaries in the Marines, and so we were kind of, he was telling me, walking me through some of this, um, you know, how his office had had to navigate that whole process. And he led these sort of interesting conversations, like what does it mean to make a, a memorial to a war that's still going on? Because the war on terror is still going on. The, you know, the, the, the legislation that authorized it is, is still in place. And then it kind of begs this question, of like what is the role of memory in war in America? And um, so I kind of did a little research and was looking at it, and. Um, I hadn't realized this, that um, the first war memorial on the National Mall was only built in 1983. It's the Vietnam Veterans uh, Memorial. And there are other memorials. They're all the people like Lincoln and Washington and prominent ones. And the intervening years, our National Mall has kind of become um, what's most prominently featured are all of our war memorials, World War II, Korea, Vietnam. It's very political to build a new one because if you're building up you know, you affect the view of the other war memorials. And so it gets very contentious with what real estate you're going to have. Um, so if you'll indulge me, I sort of had my idea for like what I would want the war memorial to be. And uh, if I were sort of, you know, king or president for a day, um, I would actually get rid of all of the war memorials on the mall. And I think that we should have one war memorial. And it would sort of look like the Vietnam Veterans War Memorial. Like it'd be a long sloping wall of granite and it would just sort of descend downward conically, kind of like something out of Dante. And uh, and because one thing you learn how to do in the military, right, is to dig. So you, we want to go up, we would dig in. You know, that makes sense if you served. And um, and because we're digging in, we wouldn't have to argue ever about who was obstructing Hugh's, Hugh's view. And you wouldn't have like the Korean War vets arguing with the Global War on Terror War vets. Um, and on the wall would just be all of the names of the war dead the more than a million Americans killed in war, starting with Crispus Attucks, who was killed at the Boston Massacre. And just keep going, going. And then, um, then in my vision, at the bottom of the war memorial, there would actually be, in the law, by law, there would be two things that would be there. And it would be a desk and a pen. And in this law, the president, he or she, whenever they went to sign a troop deployment order, the only pen they could do it with would be the pen at the base of the American War Memorial. And they'd have to walk past all million of the names before they made that decision. Um, so in my mind, that sort of been, would be like a way to, an appropriate way to commemorate all wars. Um, obviously, I think about these things. So I think the narratives we apply to wars oftentimes uh, can lead to the next war in very surprising and uh, surprising ways. Um, you know, obviously, sadly and tragically, you, you weren't able to get out all the people you would like to get out, all the people who, who fought with you, who, who worked with the U.S. Uh, military and, and other aspects of the U.S. there. Um, you know, could you talk about, maybe, if you, if you guys haven't read it, it's an incredible book. Your first book, you know, Green on Blue, uh, Elliot tells it from the perspective of a young uh, Afghan. I won't, I won't, I'll leave it from there and take it from there, but it's an incredible book. Um, but you have the thoughtfulness and the kind of introspection to, to think of the Afghan perspective. In some ways, that's what we need to know. That's what we need to think about. Um, can you talk about, you know, one of the kind of sadder lines in the books is you say the vast majority of the Afghan population has been born, you know, since uh, 1979, the Soviet invasion. The majority of the Afghan population knows nothing but war. For them, I think you said peace is a concept that requires imagination. They've never known it. Um, for the people you know who are still there, what do you think is the reality of life on the Taliban now? And do you see any hope or any chances of 
any form of kind of moderation or amelioration of the Taliban or policies kind of going forward? Oh, I, mean, I think there's always hope, and I don't think, you know, the, the, the final act uh, has in any way been written for Afghanistan, and I think that um, one thing the Taliban are certainly learning right now is that it's, you know, running an insurgency in a country is far different than governing a country, um, and I think they are being confronted with the challenges of governing Afghanistan, but um, what you alluded to was just something that always sort of struck me in just the difference between serving in Iraq and Afghanistan, and I think that's actually, it's obvious, but it took me a while to kind of understand this, was, you know, I would sit down, um, like most, you know, U.S. service members, and many times, and I would talk to local power brokers, you know, maybe Sheikh in Iraq, or, uh, you know, Mullah in Afghanistan, and we would kind of be talking to them, making the case for them of why um, their communities should support you know, maybe the Iraqi government or the Afghan government, uh, you know, who we were working with as Americans. And so, you know, maybe a generic, you know, a generic example would be, you know, she so-and-so, you know, you really need to help us out. We got to get security, you know, better in, uh, in this town uh, because then we're going to put in a road project and then we can build a school and we'll things be nice and we'll have peace. And, you know, you're kind of talking to them in these terms of, you know, a vision for what our collaboration can, you know, can look like our, their support of their government and our government. And when I served in Iraq, and, you know, this is like 2004, 2005, when you're having those conversations and you sort of say, you know, peace, like when this will all be over and better. My experience in Iraq was the people I was speaking with, when you said that to them, it was sort of returning to a state of being that had existed before. Now, granted, it was under Saddam Hussein, who was a despot, but like, you know, there was peace and you were asking them to engage with their memory. Like, oh yes, I remember my town, when there was peace here, and yes, if I work with you, maybe there will be peace here again. In Afghanistan, those conversations, there was a subtext of the conversation that was very different. Um, you know, average life expectancy in the provinces of Afghanistan is, is early 60s, someone's in their early 60s. And Afghanistan also has a very young population. So most of the people I was talking with were maybe in their mid, mid 30s to mid 40s. So they don't, you know, the war started in 1979. So we're having this conversation talking about, you know, and then there will be peace. You know, peace isn't an act of, you're not engaging with that person's memory. You're engaging with that person's imagination. They're imagining out of whole cloth. And it's a very different conversation you're having uh, when you're both trying to imagine the same thing as opposed to, to dealing with someone's memory and they're going to re, you know, go back to a different state of being. Um, so I think that that is something, that, a differentiation that always just stuck with me uh, from my time in Afghanistan. And a lot of great questions here. I might combine a few, and our and if the audience maybe just have such an incredible guest, just go to like 8.05 or a little fast. Just I'd, I'd be honored to try and get to as many as we can. Um, kind of related to what you're talking about, the early years, uh, even the early months, really, in Afghanistan. Uh, Jay asks, uh, would the war in Afghanistan uh, have been over if Tommy Franks uh, had sealed off Tora Bora and, and trapped and killed uh, Osama bin Laden? Maybe. Yeah, I mean... Who knows, right? Shoulda, coulda, woulda. Um, I think that if I think that if the United States had killed Bin Laden very early on, that might have um, created different political, domestic political conditions in the U.S. Where we could have, you know, said mission accomplished. We're now going to to leave with a sense of satisfaction instead of linger like we did. Um, I don't know, but um, I think it's certainly worth considering. Um, you touched upon obviously the kind of duality of, of, of Pakistan, and uh, you know sometimes if, that, if that's your ally, you, should, you probably don't even want to know who your foes are in some yep. ways. Uh, two questions kind of related to the the external actors. Um, Ali asks, do you think there are some countries that had an impact on the U.S. to make the war in Afghanistan last for twenty years? I think kind of in reference to that, maybe Iran as well, or Pakistan, obviously. Uh, and then another person asked him for the name. The U.S. stayed in Afghanistan after 2010, um, after Osama bin Laden has been killed. Uh, was it an order to control a nuclear Pakistan? Um, so I would say, you know, two points, I think, with regards to Pakistan. You know, one, one, one comment or sort of narrative thread you saw, particularly last summer, was this idea, I mean, from the highest levels of the, of the administration, that... Um, well, the Afghans won't fight. And if they won't fight, we can't, you know, we're not going to stick around. Uh, they've got to fight this on their own. And I'd always thought that was that sort of very disingenuous. Um, first of all, 
you know, we're the ones leaving. So if we're going to say someone's not willing to fight, you know, first of all, we're the ones not willing to fight. We're the ones who are saying we're gone. Um, so I don't know how you can claim they're not fighting when we're the ones who are getting on the planes and leaving. Um, but outside of that, it's this idea that, that the Afghan military and Afghan government is entirely delegitimate because they need our support in order to fight the Taliban. It's like, guess what? If the Pakistani ISI had just pulled the plugs on the Taliban, the Taliban would have imploded. I mean, this was war by proxy and always had been war by proxy. So the fact that the Afghans needed our help in order to fight a ISI Pakistani-backed Taliban doesn't mean that they are completely illegitimate for needing that help. But for whatever reason, that became part of the story we were telling ourselves that, they're, that, the, that the help they needed from us delegitimized them versus the Taliban, who in some way were more legitimate, even though they were also taking Pakistan's help. I think that with regards to the comment of after um, us staying in Afghanistan after 2010 in order to control a nuclear armed Pakistan, um, I wouldn't go so far as to say that you know that's that's the, the secret reason, but. I think that Afghanistan has always been a war that was fought, you know, with one eye on the counterterrorism mission, one eye on counterinsurgency, and maybe also a third eye uh, on geopolitics. And when we sit here right now, we think about geopolitics, and we, you know, fret about China potentially crossing the Taiwan Strait and how we're going to project power as Americans all the way across the Pacific Ocean. You know, wouldn't it be nice if we had access? to a massive air base in a country in Central Asia that shared a border with both China and Iran. But, you know, that shit is now so. Um, just three questions I'll put together. These are all uh, relatively related. Um, and you're not at all saying whether it's President Obama or President Trump or President Biden, that there were easy options out there. There was usually a question of choosing between the least worst yeah. option. Uh, but in terms of the catastrophic disaster of last summer, um, uh, you know, Diane asked, uh, given that the, the war in Afghanistan, uh, what would say, so, you know, what better ways could the American withdrawal have been uh, better structured? Robert asks, uh, wouldn't it have been preferable to leave, you know, three, 5,000 troops in Afghanistan? And Ed asks, um, how could the U.S. have been better withdrawing, you know, 2,500 troops, NATO troops, uh, Afghan allies? Because um, once the once the word gets out, he says, isn't panic just going to ensue? So, I mean, it's not easy, but but how do you think it could have been done differently? Yeah, I I, I mean, so listen, I believe that from a geostrategic standpoint, the wisest thing for America had to have done would have been to, around 2017, 2018, sort of accept the fact that yes, there were massive sunk costs, this war went on too long, and we, it probably cost too much, but we expended all of that. And now we're at a point, 2017, 2018, where we have less than 10,000 U.S. troops in Afghanistan. We as Americans are taking de minimis casualties. The Afghan military are fighting the Taliban. And what we get out of that is Afghanistan is firmly under our influence. To me, that seems like a good deal. Had I been president in 27, 2018, I would have given, given one speech, explained that to the American people, who, oh, by the way, aren't even, don't, care about, don't care about the war in Afghanistan. If you look at the polling, they would have moved on. I think strategically, our nation would be in a much stronger position today. But that is all water under the bridge. If we're talking sort of 2020, 2021, um, I, uh, I, have a, I have sympathy for the position the Biden administration was in. Now, it was a position they put themselves in, but I do have sympathy for the position that they were in. And the position they found themselves in after announcing this withdrawal is, okay, well, if we just start evacuating everybody out of Afghanistan, it's going to be a massive show of no confidence, and that could precipitate the collapse of the Afghan government. Um, and that is a reasonable argument to make. The challenge is the Biden administration had a strategy after they announced the withdrawal that was completely, um, completely hinged on there being a decent interval, what Nixon called the decent interval, right? Which is the moment the last US troops leave to the moment you see the end game in the country. Um, you know, whether, you know, hopefully it's not a collapse, but if it is a collapse, you know, what's that decent interval? Maybe it's, you know, Vietnam, we pull out in 72, Saigon collapses in 75. So maybe you get two years, three years, maybe six months even. Um, but so that when the collapse happens, we as Americans aren't holding you back. The Biden administration bet everything on that. And when they didn't get the decent interval, there was no contingency plan at all. It was just pan it was the pandemonium we saw on TV when Afghanistan collapsed before we had left. And so what do I fault the Biden administration with? 
of having no contingency plan, of no one sitting there in the meeting and be like, well, what if we don't get a decent enough? Or what if we announce this in April and before we can get everybody out in September, the whole country collapses? No one answered that question. No one sat around the table and said, we have to have a plan for that. There was no plan for that. Um, so I fault the Biden administration for that. You know, much the same way to be a, an equal opportunity falter. Like, I fault the Bush, I, like, I've never, for Iraq, I've never actually fault, I don't fault the Bush administration for thinking that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. I remember the conversation in 2003. Everybody thought he had weapons of mass destruction. He, he actively was trying to fool the whole world. What I've always faulted, I fault the Bush administration for when we invaded Iraq, having this narrative of, well, we're going to be greeted as liberators. The Iraqi people hate Saddam Hussein. You know, the Shia, there was a Shia uprising after the Gulf War. This is going to be like rolling through Iraq. It's going to be like rolling into Belgium in 1944. It's going to be great. They're going to love us. Okay, I hope so, but what if they don't? And it didn't take a genius to ask that question. There was no contingency plan there either. And we got, you know, the insurgency in Iraq. So again, it's this idea of... Um, administrations having blind spots and everyone making assumptions. And when no one questions the assumption and you don't have any contingency plan, that's when you know you get these really nasty outcomes. Um, and like I said, I'll just kind of combine these and, and, and just two more questions. And for sake of time, we'll, uh, you know, volunteering LA to sign books afterwards. I, I highly recommend it. Um, but some of these are longer questions, so I might just take parts of, of what people have written, um, you know, Adam, you know, asked at the end, he said, um, where do you see Afghanistan headed in the next 20 to 50 years um, related to the uh, Taliban? Naveed asked, um, was the peace deal with the Taliban a good option to end this war? Um, and related to kind of how the U.S. approached the Taliban now, Alan asked, you know, should we re uh, release the Afghan funds that we are currently withholding? And uh, Halil uh, asks, um, you know, uh, with the distinction made between Al Qaeda and the Taliban, do you think it is better for the American government to recognize the Taliban or release frozen fun funds, uh, or should they not be recognized? What will happen in reality, and will the is the American government eventually recognize uh, the Taliban? Do you think? Um, so I'll start with the last and try to go forward. Sure. Um, I think if the American government ever recognizes the Taliban, it should only be after the Taliban has made certain concessions. Um, you know, like letting girls go to school, like, you know, reform, reforming themselves. And I think we're too early to know whether or not they can make those meaningful concessions. But I don't think we should be recognizing the Taliban or releasing those funds uh, without getting something in return. Uh, and I don't mean that as American, there's no sort of, as a, you know, humanity should get something in return and they should behave, you know, appropriately as members of the international community for for them to basically to, to be given those concessions. And so I don't think we are um, there yet. Uh, with regards to where I see Afghanistan going in the next 20 to 50 years, um, you know, prognostication is a really bad business to be in. I try not to be in it, but um, you know, there is a sense in America that, you know, oh, well, we're just gonna turn the page in Afghanistan. We're not gonna turn the page on Afghanistan, nor should we turn the page on Afghanistan. Um, you know, our countries are sort of married together now um, in, in many ways, most profound of which is that, you know, we have a, a huge influx now of Afghans who have come here through the SIV program who, you know, we need to support through things like the Afghan Adjustment Act um, so these people can get green cards, can start working here, um, raise their families here. I mean, these people will be great Americans. So in some ways, you know, what is the future of Afghanistan? Maybe, at least for the next few years, the future of Afghanistan is right here uh, in America with these Afghans who will come here and become citizens. So I'm, I feel optimistic when I think about that. And then just, these two just kind of quickly, it, it, following up on, on the Afghan people themselves, uh, Beth asks, is there a way around the Afghan women narrative that doesn't deprive them of agency and leave them forever to be traded upon as victims and as a commodity for political stakeholders? Um, well, I think sadly, Afghan women right now, their fates are with the, you know, are, are, are with the Taliban. I, um, you know, I write about my children in this book. Um, you know, I think they're great and adorable. I don't know if the whole world has to think they're great and adorable, actually. But I write about them because I think children oftentimes can really just cut through all the BS and 
you know, understand an issue pretty clearly. And I noted that when I would try to explain the war to my kids, the only, the, the thing they had the easiest time understanding, well, why were we fighting this war? You know, we have counterterrorism, 9-11, and I will talk about that. And you say, well, I, one of the reasons we, we were fighting there was so girls can go to school. And they get that. And I actually think that, you know, it's sort of remarkable. That was one of the clearest things that everyone knew, you know, right versus wrong. This, this you know, was, um, uh, you know, this was something worth, worth fighting over. And I think the, you know, the, the fate of Afghan women, um, yeah, this is something that uh, I think should weigh on all of our consciences right now. And I don't say that taking away agency from them. Um, I think we saw, particularly after the fall of Kabul, some of the bravest people in the streets were Afghan women. Um, but, you know, we shouldn't forget Afghanistan. We certainly shouldn't forget what's going on with women in Afghanistan right now. Yeah, and um, this is a good question, kind of way to kind of give you a chance to kind of give your your overall perspective and, and kind of what you hope we as a nation have taken away from this. You know, I think perhaps I would say as myself as a civilian, uh, civilians, those who haven't served, maybe what we should take away from this. Um, Carl asks a, a good question. You know, could you please compare the exit from Vietnam to the exit from Afghanistan? And maybe, you know, what are the lessons learned? And just and more directly, just for you in general, what do you hope we as the American public are taking away from all of this? I think if there's one war, if there's one lesson from the, from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan that I would like, you know, put up in lights, um, and I think is actually distinct to those wars, um, is what we talked about before which is this construct of how we wage wars. Um, waging a war with an all-volunteer military uh, and funding it through our deficit and anesthetizing the American people at the cost of war, I think is extremely dangerous in a democracy. You know, we should be, everyone should have, when we go to war, it should be existentially painful for us. Like, look at our good war, the, the, you know, the Civil War, World War II. Like, these are not wars we could fight for 20 years. Like, they were very tough to sustain. The amount of just manpower, how disruptive they were to our society. So the idea that war can kind of just be this thing that goes on as background noise in our lives, it is, it is dangerous. I would call it late empire behavior. I mean, if you look historically, you know, what was the, the fall of the Roman Empire was when they started outsourcing their wars to the people who lived in the provinces very far from Rome. And I think in the United States, something that we are doing when we fight our wars this way is you know, we're not outsourcing them to other provinces per se, but we're outsourcing them to an increasingly self-selecting segment of our society. Uh, and if you look at the military now, it's much more intergenerational than it ever used to be. Uh, it's much more, they're much stronger regional affiliations. You know, people are recruited from parts of the country and are recruited from other parts of the country. And there is a massive civil military divide in this country. And if you look back again through, through history, um, you know, from Caesar's Rome, to Napoleon's France, when you couple a very large standing military with extremely dysfunctional domestic politics, it is a hazard for a healthy democracy. And that are, those are the exact conditions we have going on in America right now. And if you were to ask me, what is the single greatest national security threat that faces the United States right now? I would say it is our own internal uh, political dysfunction. Again, um, I highly recommend the, the Fifth Act and really all of Elliot's books. We'll be you know, selling them outside afterwards, and Elliot will kindly sign them. And, and I, again, I, I, I want to say you know, earnestly on behalf of, of the council and all, all for the rest of the membership, thank you to the, the veterans and the active duty and the and SIVs, the Iraqis and Afghans here tonight. Just finally, I just want to extend a, you know, a, a, a personal thanks on behalf of the council again, Elliot, for your many, many years of service and your continuing to serve the country in, in a different way to force us and challenge us to think about you know, what it is we're doing in the world and how we're doing it. Thank you.